later. Uh, okay, in the meantime, let's crack on with the Friday panel, shall we? Joining us to get our teeth into some of the big stories of the week. Uh, property expert and broadcaster and friend of Talk Radio, Russell Quirk, returns to the panel. Russell, hello, good evening, my friend. Good evening, Daryl. How are you? Yes, I'm very well. And uh, Tom Spencer as well, who is a, a political co political commentator and journalist. Tom, hello, good evening, my friend. I'm so sorry I, uh, I dropped your name earlier on. <laughs> I've got some making up to do. I hope you can forgive me. But welcome, my friend. Welcome. Um, it's lovely to have you on the show. Listen, we've got lots and lots to get into. And I think we should probably start with um, uh, arguably one of the biggest stories of the week, although it's sort of come and gone a bit in a way that several people will be fairly grateful for. Uh, the Pandora Papers, released earlier on this week, um, really blew the lid on the rich and powerful and what they do with their money and how effectively how they avoid paying taxes um there's been a whole load of stories this isn't something that's particularly new it's not something that we didn't know was happening uh, but it is something that has blown up and the individuals involved there's been a lot of individual stories and it's generated this conversation about tax russell let me ask you just quite simply is this another one of those moments it should be another one of those watershed moments where we say people should be paying their fair share uh, yes, I think it is. And I guess the other question is how many of these moments do we need to have before we stop talking about it and governments start doing something about it? Um, let, let's be clear, most of these individuals, including Tony Blair, the, the big hypocrite, uh, who apparently say £320,000 in stamp duty by buying a property through an offshore vehicle, uh, you know, he and thousands of others have saved tax. Uh, we, I, we shouldn't probably say evaded tax, because although they have, they've saved tax arguably legitimately they have worked within the rules now all the government needs to do and i remember george osborne talking about this about a decade ago is to tax british citizens on their global income in the uk but regardless of where that income derives from it's as simple as that right so just do that and whether you earn a million pounds in pandora panama you know the cayman islands or wherever you then are taxed in the uk as a british citizen if this is your domicile on that uh, that income regardless that that's the fix but it seems that the government are increasingly hesitant to do so and i suggest there's two reasons for that daryl one is because uh, in their view we can argue about the political ramifications of this all day long uh, is that they don't want to scare away the wealth creators from britain they don't want to see a brain drain like we saw in the uh, in the 70s i suggest another reason is that the conservative party don't want to deter donors from the conservative party mm, that's been a really big part of the conversation this week hasn't it russell tom this argument that um that, that in order to retain i mean it's a big it's a big old conversation this isn't it and uh, we've been having this this uh, this economic conversation for a very long time and we will for a long time to come but this argument that we need to encourage the wealth creators to stay that the low tax economy encourages enterprise it encourages them to create jobs or wealth and opportunity and it trickles down etc we can get into the ins and outs of um uh, the merits and failures of trickle down economics tom but but ultimately are we seeing here an example of it not working i.e we are encouraging these wealth creators to, to 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 stay to spend to to you know with with uh, creating loopholes effectively and and they aren't really creating wealth or contributing anywhere near as much as they should do so is this in itself an argument against that point um i'm not sure the most commonly used loopholes are really ones which do actually create uh much wealth so for example if we go back to the um tony blair incident which uh russell uh, brought up why uh, i don't really see the argument as convincing that allowing you to buy a corporation as opposed to buying the corporation properties is a more efficient way of keeping a person here than just making them pay the stamp duty that everyone else has to pay especially if you're trying to get that property for your personal use so i think there, there are definitely loopholes that we do need to change and i don't think all of them changing will actually have that much impact on pushes and pulls into the UK. But also I, I would be wary of cutting everything. And I think we do always need to think twice um, when we are making these changes because every economic change that we try and make, there's always a slight second harm which comes uh, from it. And so I think these are the kind of questions we need to take slowly and be quite careful with how we change them. Russell, is, it, is this also an argument for 
international cooperation. I mean, this has to be. If, if nothing else, it's an argument for international cooperation, isn't it? In the in the you know the very point here is that if we we can do what we want with corporation tax, we can do what we want with income tax, uh, and and the rates at which we charge people or tax on dividends, capital gains tax, whatever else. If there is a part of the world that they can escape to or they can funnel their money off to, then they will take it. And the best way to deal with this problem is to close those loopholes in other parts of the world. Well, yeah, yeah, but you can't tell the Cayman Islands uh, and, and particularly let's take Switzerland as a good example, you know, it, its own sovereign nation. You, the British, and, and unfortunately, it would kind of be a reverse EU, wouldn't it? We can't tell Switzerland what they should do insofar as their banking and tax policy. Um, so, of course, it, it's right and it has to be right that different countries have different regimes for different reasons, you know, and that there are a whole bunch of territories across the world that have a very, very low, in fact, some a zero rate of tax, like Monaco, for instance. Mm. Um, so it has to be right that they're allowed to do that. The, the problem is not other nations and the problem is not people breaking the rules. It's the fact that as a British citizen, the law here says that you can secrete your income away elsewhere and hide it from tax. As I say, it's a very simple fix. If you want to be a British citizen, who doesn't, frankly, I mean, you should want to, uh, then you pay tax as a British citizen on everything you earn, no matter where you earn it. But it still, it still allows that. you to, to, to be a non-DOM, though. That wouldn't close the non-DOM loophole, would it? In that you could you could be a citizen of somewhere else. It would be relatively simple, presumably, for you to, if you were a high net worth individual, become a citizen of somewhere that would welcome you with open arms. But, but you could, but to Tom's point, then there'd be unintended consequences of being a non-DOM, whereby you couldn't visit the UK, um, you know, for a certain, for, for longer than a certain period of time each year. Um, you know, you 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 would have disadvantages. I don't know. Sure. I, I don't. It doesn't seem to be bothering those people who've got lovely villas in the Monaco, though, does it, uh, Russell? Well, no, no. I, I guess I, I, but look, we're talking about British citizens here. Tony Blair's a British citizen, right? He's not a resident of Monaco or Panama. You know, he he has used a legitimate, but we would argue, most of us would argue, an immoral means to avoid paying tax that the rest of us have to pay. And I think actually, you know, this is this is not just a Jimmy Carr moment. When, when you've got politicians that spend most of their career preaching about fairness and equity and value and morals and so on uh, and then we find out that an awful lot of them have just been sticking their fingers up at us and doing the opposite of what they're preaching hey shock horror politicians are hypocrites um oh. you know that, that t tony blair has a lot to answer for doesn't he um but but I, th this is he, not he, he does, he does russell but we've mentioned we're mentioning tony blair here quite a lot and there are a lot of characters involved here and, and a huge number of them uh, are tory donors <laughs> by the way yeah. so as much as as much as tony blair has uh but, has, but that's, has what been they, that's what the story that's why the loopholes haven't closed isn't mm. it because you know the, the tory party you know they they rely on uh, an awful lot of income coming in from those donors you know different to the Labour Party you get the majority of their income from the unions um, th th and that's what I was saying a few minutes ago I, I suspect that the Tories do not want to come down too heavily on these people for fear of not getting the donations and then the party machine grinds to a halt. Uh, Tom just briefly really really briefly where there is a will there's a way we know that to be true right and if we want to do something and we want to get something done invariably there will be a way to do it to put pressure on them diplomatic uh, 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 channels that we can use uh, sanctions that we can use is it time that we got tough on this and we closed off those loopholes or did what joe biden has has begun to do uh, in fairness i mean you say what you like about joe biden at the moment there are there are lots of ups and downs but one thing that he has done in recent weeks is have a conversation with ireland and got them to close a couple of those loopholes and change a few tax laws and um, we can can't we if if we have the will to do it where international agreement is possible, then that will obviously be the preferable solution because then you don't go into all the uh, unintended consequences, which myself and Russell have both uh, hinted at. However, the problem with that is if you can't get every single country to agree, then people will just invest in the countries who are outside of the uh, agreement. But there are still ways we can get around that and still make people pay off our share. So, for example, in the case of uh, corporation taxes, we can tax the cash flow as opposed to the, the profit. Profit can be moved very, very easily, but cash flow can't unless you just take all the presence of a company out of the country, which is very, very unlikely to, uh, to, to happen. So there are ways we can make these high wealth corporation and individual pay their fair share without going through the international agreement route, which 
is a bit messy because obviously the Cayman Islands, Georgia, etc., will be very unlikely to agree. Sure. Okay. Uh, while we're tackling big uh, moral and financial questions uh, wrapped up in social issues, should the Saudis have been allowed to take over Newcastle United? It's effectively what's happened this week. It's a big, big moment for that football club, a big moment for Premier League football. But there are lots of questions being raised about this so-called sports washing and whether we want them involved in British business and certainly in the Premier League. Uh, Russell Quirk will answer that question with Tom Spencer as well on our Friday panel on Talk Radio Next. Incredible. And the efforts that Newcastle fans have been going through this week because the takeover has been completed. Um, an investment fund um, linked to the Saudi government, the Saudi regime, has taken an 80% stake in Newcastle United. There's been lots of back and forth about this in the last couple of weeks or so, whether or not it's acceptable to have a regime uh, with questionable human rights records in the Premier League. Let's speak to Russell Quirk on this and Tom Spencer. They are with us tonight on our Friday panel. Um, Tom, let's start with you on this one. I mean, what, what you know, what's your, what's your instinct telling you as you see... The Saudi regime financially involved was a majority stakeholder in Newcastle United. It's something I actually find rather uh, difficult because I do understand the uh, jubilation from the uh, Newcastle fans finally being rid of uh, Mike Ashley. And as a uh, Coventry fan who's also had many, many problems with uh, my club's owners. I can understand why anyone would be so excited to see such a, a wealthy investment fund taking over. Um, I think with this one, I'm probably going to lean towards saying that it should have been allowed, purely because we already have a very big culture in that we do accept m mass Saudi uh, financial in investment within the economy. I, I think I read earlier that the same investment fund hold massive shares in uh, Disney and we aren't looking to make a victim of Disney. We're not looking to make a victim of all the arms co companies who Saudi use. And unless we see a, a big sort of strategic change from the government, then I don't see why Newcastle should be the victim of the first cultural shift away from, from Saudi Arabia, especially because they can be quite an important strategic um, ally in the region okay that's a really good point isn't it and russell and you know for, for all of the um for all of the the instinct i mean my instinct russell when i see this is uh to feel horrified actually and, and recoil in horror as a football fan particularly to have this kind of money in the game for a start uh, but also after all the pushing and pulling over this and all the issues around sports washing it would have been great to see football and the premier league stand firm and say they didn't want that involved that the point that tom makes though is it's so ingrained in society in business in sport already the um the the it it just is isn't it well the, the first thing to say is you, you talk about the jubilation of the fans um I, I was talking to a friend of mine about this last night who owns a big property developer in um in, in newcastle um stripe homes name uh, name drop plug plug um <laughs> and no he was saying uh, that he thinks this is not just about the football now this is fantastic for newcastle as a city as a region in terms of investment uh, house prices regeneration uh, and and so on so so I, I think that this will have a very positive effect uh, in terms of profile and raising awareness, if you like, of Newcastle. You know, it, it's it's almost a kind of market-led levelling up, um, which, which, look, has to be a good thing. Um, but, but the point about the morals behind this, I mean, you know, for any Southampton, Wolves, Brentford or Brighton fan to have an issue with this when their, their clubs are owned by the Chinese and people that have made their money from gambling um, would be surely rather hypocritical, wouldn't it? Um, so I, I think that we can moralise all we like about the Saudis. And of course, they've got an extremely questionable reputation as a regime. But so have many others. And we seem to have accepted everybody else's money in the premiership. So why not the Saudis? Mm, that That's the point, isn't it? And and, and listen, I, I, I've been there as well. I'm a Bolton Wanderers fan. And we had an owner who was um, less than great. We've been through the mill. We've been um, into administration. We've we've really, really suffered. And we now have a, a, an owner at the club who seems to be really decent, seems to have a strong moral compass. They were in the news last week for banning gambling, uh, gambling uh, kiosks and for refusing to take any gambling money. So, you know, they, they seem to be on the, on the other end of it. I suppose the question is, 
Russell that this is such a high profile example and this 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 argument that oh well it already exists oh well there are already there's already Saudi money in the system oh well there's already questionable regimes in the system that surely isn't a reason for us to want to take a second look is it should this not be the moment that is a catalyst for getting that kind of money out of the game I, I, I guess, guess, I guess, but look, the, the the game consumes so much money. The owners have all got to have extremely deep pockets, and if we want to keep playing football, paying footballers five hundred grand a week, and charging fans eighty quid to go and see their sides, well, then of course, you know, that, that that all has to be kind of, you know, that that also has to be bankrolled, doesn't it? In the first instance, in terms of the money that has to go into the grounds and the players to, you know, to to attract that. Um, so, look, I, I, I guess it takes us back to the first conversation or the first part of the conversation we were having this evening, doesn't it, about the rules. You know, it seems that the Saudis, having convinced the FA that the the, the sovereignty of Saudi Arabia, so the royal family themselves, are not going to have uh, direct control, and they're certainly not going to be directors of Newcastle Football Club, you know, it fits within the rules. And, and, and actually, look, it makes a mockery of the rules that they were initially banned from being part of Newcastle United because of fears over them controlling Newcastle United. Uh, 30 seconds later, they say, oh, I'll tell you what, then we won't be directors, although that doesn't mean that they're not controlling the club, of course. And the FA are very, very happy with it. Look, money talks, 300 million quid talks. And, that, and that's what this is all about. And in football, it always will be. Mm. They've also become the richest football club in the world now, really. I mean, they are now effectively the richest football club in the world. And... I mean, I, I can, as a fan, there's a fan uh, in me, Tom, that goes, oh, my God, that's incredible. That's absolutely thrilling, the prospect of your team becoming one of the global superpowers. But but I don't know. I mean, just how, how many things do we have to stack up before the balance gets tipped on human rights? Surely, surely there aren't a, there aren't a number of there aren't any number of things in the world or, or in business or in football for us to be able to write off a human rights record. Well, I don't think we should be writing off the human rights record of the Saudi government and the royal family there. But I, I do think we need to be a bit accepting of the difference between the investment fund, which as part of the deal with the Premier League has a separation from the uh, royal family in regards relating to the football club. So it won't be as if the king of Saudi Arabia is personally in St. James's Park or whatever they choose to, to, to name it now. It will be distantly r run by a person who I believe is British. And it's not exactly like we've got these human rights of view that are directly profiting off of uh, British uh, football. Um, so I think it's one of those things, especially if you consider the, tr the tremendous um, benefits it will have to both Newcastle United Football Club as well as the city of Newcastle. You can overlook it a, a bit. It, it's not something I'm uncomfortable I'm just, I'm just saying, sure. but do you know, I, I, I just, I just, I, I'm just not sure you can, Tom, because I see, hmm. I see, I see the uh, the benefit, and I and I agree, and I, I'm I'm absolutely on board with it. I'm absolutely on board with it. I, I've I've seen firsthand as a Bolton fan what what the demise of a football club or investment in a football club does to a town. Absolutely, you know, completely. That's been that's been right at the end of my nose for a very, very long time. But, but I really struggle. But, sh but surely, surely, I mean, you're shaking your head there, Russell. But surely, we should be able to do that without allowing a regime who have a horrendous human rights record to effectively um, partake in a game, a, a, an exercise of sports washing, a massive PR exercise. It, it, it's a it's a worthy moral endeavour, I think. But but look, I, I just think it's you know who, who's the arbiter of that. Who, who decides how bad that regime has to be for them not to be able to buy a football club? I mean, look, you know, we, we allowed Roman Abramovich to buy Chelsea many, many years ago. And, and look, without casting too many aspersions back, I expect his lawyers uh, earn millions of pounds an hour and will eat us all for breakfast if I say the wrong thing. Um, but let's just say he's a friend of people in high places over there. You know, he has such a questionable work reputation that he's not allowed to be a British citizen. He's only allowed to spend a certain amount of time mm. in Britain. Um, but we took his money and we seem to be happy to. I, I, I suspect, you know, suspect let's you, not. Dale, is, isn't, isn't this the, the objections are coming from the Man City, Liverpool, Manchester United fans that know that Newcastle will probably end up being top of the league in two Yeah, no, I agree. I agree entirely. I agree entirely. But I think, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a, a fan of a football club who's been through it, who, who knows how it would feel to receive this money, Put, I, I can very much put myself in the shoes of Newcastle. We've sort of been through a relatively similar situation, and I'd be repulsed. I'd be absolutely repulsed. I wouldn't be anywhere near the place. I really, really wouldn't. And I, I, I must admit that I am 
are completely delighted and I am incredibly proud of the fact that we have a decent owner in football and I just I just think football can do better can't it can't it do better listen Russell stay there <laughs> Tom hold that thought because we've got to take a break we'll come back Russell Quirk is with us uh, tonight he was a political commentator and property expert and Tom Spencer as well on talk radio it's quarter to 11 and 1000 Russell Quirk uh, political commentator and property expert is on the panel tonight with Tom Spencer a journalist um, and political commentator. I want to get to this story because it's really fascinating. And I've just come back from Spain. Literally today I've come back from Spain. And I was talking about this uh, earlier on this week. It's it's a really fascinating idea that I think will probably split us a little bit. Spain have decided to introduce a scheme uh, where they will give money to 18-year-olds on their birthday. So when you turn 18 in Spain, you will be given a cash injection of €400. Euros with the intention of you spending it in the country on cultural things, going to bars, going to restaurants, celebrating your 18th, I guess, to try to give a bit of an injection into an economy, particularly in Spain, with a lack of tourism in the last 18 months, that's been really, really badly affected. It's kind of it's kind of a universal basic income conversation again, isn't it? Um, Tom, good idea or not? Should we be giving our 18-year-olds a couple of hundred quid to try and kickstart the economy? Well, personally, I've been a, a universal basic income fan for quite a while. The, the, the evidence I've seen is that the inflationary effects are very, very small. The uh, disemployment effects are basically none. So if if it is the case in Spain, I don't know much about their economic situation at the moment, that they do need more cash in the economy to help um, spark up some growth and really help recover from the pandemic. Then this seems like it would be... A decent way of doing it i'm not convinced that only doing it to people when they turn 18 is probably the best way of doing it but at least based on on the uk evidence that the rate of poverty seems to be highest among young people then this would be a good way to address that um so i'd probably say it's probably not the best idea but it's also not a bad one and I'd say it's probably better than nothing. Okay, better than nothing. Uh, Russell, uh, you are uh, you're a dyed in the wool conservative. I can see you on talk radio TV shifting in your seat, rocking back and forth, waiting to get your teeth into this one. Um, what do you think? It's utterly ridiculous, Daryl. Um, and the, the <laughs> fact that it's you know, it's it's madness. I mean, giving money to eighteen years, what on earth do we think they're going to spend it on? They're probably going to spend it on cigarettes and I don't know. Upgrading ah, no, come TikTok. on, that's such a. It's, and, and of course they are. They're, they're that, eighteen that, year olds that, are not. Come on, that, that, is such a, that is such a lazy. It's such a lazy. Eighteen year olds. It's, it's not, the classic. Out, you hand you out. hand out a bit of money and someone's going to buy a widescreen TV and an iPhone and some are not, 18 year olds are not fiscally responsible individuals how ludicrous that we think that they're going to disseminate don't. their 400 euros in the right place to help the economy and and look the, the the matter of the fact is that this is going to come from spanish taxpayers so the spanish government are going to tax the working people more in order to give a free load of money to a load of wayward 18-year-olds. But they would, but they would Frankly, gain. If 18-year-olds want, want to hang spend on. money, they should go and get a job. Hang on a minute, Russell. It's the universal credit argument, though, isn't it? And I'm sure Tom will want to come back on this, in this in a second, somebody who's, who's been following that. Because the point, the fact of the matter is that you're not just handing cash over to people. It is an economic injection. I mean, there are lots and lots and lots of models and some and that, and an incredibly small handful of examples where we know that this kind of uh, uh, stimulus... A package stimulus idea does actually work. It doesn't affect jobs. It doesn't affect inflation that that much, and it's it, it also doesn't it also stimulates. It does genuinely do what it's supposed to do. So the idea is that regardless of how they spend it, it will be stimulating the economy at a time when the economy needs to be stimulated. And then they should give it to everybody, shouldn't they? Well, I mean, maybe, maybe that's the argument. Tom, is that the argument? But the tax has to go up. I mean, okay, t Tom, con convince convince Russell, because because I, I, I'm not 100% sure it's going to happen, but we can give it a go. Convince Russell that universal basic income is the right tax. <laughs> um, so, firstly, I'd say it's a much, much more efficient way of providing welfare than the current ways we do it. When you have all the rules, all the way to get in and out, it becomes very, very uh, bureaucratic, very hard to manage. And effectively, it means that there'll always be people who get in the gaps, people who get too much, people get too little. You, you get caught up in question you don't really need to be having. So if you just do a flat rate for everyone so that everyone will have a, a fair rate so they can live a decent life, then that is more efficient. And also, 
it would it would be something where you would be taxed more, but you're also getting money, so you'll be taxed as a percentage of the money you get. And um, there's been a very good study by the uh, UBI Centre, which is an American think tank looking at the British welfare system, and it said, um, and I think they worked out a UBI which would reduce poverty by about seventy percent, and that would be with a flat income tax of forty percent. So that would actually be less income tax for for, for the higher earners, and it, it would actually mean that every pretty, pretty much everyone in the country, with a few exceptions, would be in a worse, in a, a better, I should say, uh, position. Um, and and also, I would flat... say on Russell, Russell's got his head in his hands. Sorry, a flat income tax of forty percent—that's nuts. That would kill an economy within weeks. Well, it wouldn't if you would combine it with massive cash injections it's it, it's not even like a, a, a it's left argument it? it's not at all it's something that milton friedman of all people was writing about in the 60s he famously said that the best way to revive an economy when it's going through recession to inject cash it was helicopter money that's all milton friedman it's stuff well, which isn't just a, a left-wing idea the right-wing thumb he would be a fantastic a politician, politician. Uh, i think we would all be much much richer and in a much yeah. better place. Sounds, and also, it sounds then, like the, the 1970s about... being relived before our very eyes. What an absolute disaster waiting to happen. High tax and giving money to people for nothing that don't work. What a fantastic idea. I think we tried that in the 70s. It didn't work. But are you, are you, Russell, are you, are you sort of against that on instinct? On, on, there's, a, there's a sort of a, there's, there's almost a sort of social aversion to that on your part rather than it being an economic calculation because there are economic calculations that you can make that tell you that, uh, that the idea of a, let's let's park the the 40 tax rate thing for a minute but the idea that a universal basic income kind of model and perhaps a micro model specifically for a certain section of society or for a certain period of time in order to kickstart the economy during a time when it really really needs it post pandemic could actually work yeah so so the, the problem with economics is that it doesn't take account of behavior it's it's kind of theoretical and linear um and actually what economists think people do or should happen when you distribute money like this for instance doesn't necessarily happen and any student of behavioral economics can i can i, can I ask you a question can i, can I ask you a very specific question okay i hear i hear your point so, so it's it's about what well, the thing we can't rely on is that the people will use that money that they are given to put it in the right parts of the economy that will stimulate the economy why do you believe in low tax no, I believe in a fair tax, but I don't believe that people that work harder and earn more should pay more. But you they should they should no, pay you, the same percentage. No, but you believe but you believe in a, in in in, in gen generally speaking, in general terms, you believe in a low tax economy, right? And the idea that conservatives believe in a low tax economy is that it puts more money in the pockets of people, and the people spend that money, and it it helps to fuel the economic cycle. So isn't it this exactly the same point? It's exactly the same principle, isn't it? If you're saying that we can't trust people to spend money in the right places to stimulate the economy if we give it to them in a universal basis basic income kind of way, then you, under, you undermine the very notion of conservative economics, don't you? No, no, because it, it's a sense of proportionality and incentive, isn't it? So, you know, it, it, if I, if I let's say, decide I want to earn £100,000 a year and I want to pay 20% tax on that, the same as someone that earns £10,000 a year, I think that's fair. But I don't think it's right that someone that earns £100,000 a year should pay 40%, particularly if that money is then given to other people that perhaps are not creating such wealth for the economy. They're not employing people. Um, it, it, it seems completely counterintuitive because it actually stokes and promotes the wrong behavior you know my, my my kids who are between 12 and 27 years old if i turn around to them one morning and said here's 400 quid they would not get out of bed yeah but all yes but yes but 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 russell all of the examples of this being trialed and done and worked through um have proven the opposite they've proven where? I mean, Tom, show, Tom, show me an example of where that stimulated Tom, and grown an economy better than lowering tax for people that work hard and are wealth creators show oh, me an example tom tom pick up my point um, so a good example was, I think there was a trial experimented in Mexico, which there's a very good paper on by Esther DeFlo and Abhijit Banerjee, who were Nobel Prize winners, I believe, two uh, years ago. And they looked into the uh, disemployment effect to see if people, um, sort of young people like myself, when given a universal basic income would lie in bed or spend it on booze, bags and sex. And the evidence simply doesn't support that. People use that to pay for their bills. The biggest expenditures for young people are rent, transport and food. People aren't just wasting away their lives on going on nights out and buying fancy dinners or avocado toast. It's just a blatant myth and no one who knows any young people actually 
air believes this. It the also, is, it, it also young... Tom, Tom, sorry, we're out of time, but I want to make one final point because it also assumes the worst of people, doesn't it? It assumes the worst of our behaviour. And one thing that we know, it's not, it's not a direct example of this being trialled in a universal basic income kind of way, but one thing that we know is that if we give people autonomy, they generally are quite good with it. That if we give people the freedom to do things, and actually that's something else that you would support as well, Russell, I assume, is that if we give people the freedom to make their own choices and autonomy in all sorts of different situations, it generally leads to quite do, uh, quite good decisions on the whole. Listen, we're out of time, but oh boy, we've got right into the meat of some big old subjects there, haven't we, chaps? Um,